Yeah, so uh, I'm certainly, uh, after three and a half months sabbatical, I've, I've got about four things off the seven page to-do list done, so I did get a few things done for my wife, but I'm really ready to go and I'm certainly ready to rumble. Um, the disclaimer, um, and we'll move straight into the story. So look, the, the main project we have is Irahidi, and uh, I'll talk a lot about that today. Uh, it's, a, it's a big project, which is what attracted me to the story. I mean, my history in zinc goes back to my grandfather, in fact, Mr Allnut, my, my, father, my mother's father, who worked at EZ in Tasmania all of his career. And we used to go on holidays down there and we would drive down. And in those days, you could drive through the smelter and he would point out, he was electrical engineer, the things that he designed. And, uh, and the other thing that he did is when they finished with the filter cloths, they would sell them off. And a lot of people had them for paint drop sort of filters. And I've still got one of those. So every time I look at it, I think of my grandfather, I think of zinc. So it's in my blood almost. Um, and then my first job in base metals was in zinc, Golden Grove Project. So I was involved in the, the start-up of that. I was the marketing manager uh, at 26 years of age, so it was a long time ago. But we went all over the world selling zinc to uh, the Germans, the Koreans, uh, the Japanese smelter pool. And in those days, it was a very small market. And it's grown you know, to an 11 million tonne market. It's an enormous market and growing compounded about 5% per annum. So I've always been interested in, in zinc. I disappeared into nickel for a while, um, but I've, I've certainly come back with a vengeance. And I think the thing that attracted me to this, to the company was the, the board, uh, but also the project as well. And you know, you've got two and a half or two million uh, tonnes of zinc. Uh, if you can get this project into production, this is a, a multi-decade project. This is not a small, short life, high cost operation. It's a complete opposite. Uh, the metallurgy results are good. Uh, the project's got a lot of optionality. Uh, you know, there's, there's a nearly a 500 million tonne potentially resource at sort of a half percent cutoff. So if you can do something with upgrading the ore, then you've really got a, a, ma a massive amount of, of zinc that can come out of the system. And there's enormous amount of exploration potential here. Only 30% of the, of the strike has been explored so far. Let's talk a lot about zinc. I think it's a bit of an unloved metal. Everyone's talking about lithium and gold and probably not talking about much nickel at the moment, but certainly zinc. It's, it's been around for a long time. It's the fourth most used metal in the world, which is staggering behind iron ore, aluminium and copper. Uh, as I said, it's about 11 million tonne market growing at 5% per annum compound. And it, it's one of those things that's a bit boring, but everyone sees it every day. Your motor car is galvanising, protected from rust, roofing. And it's just everywhere around the world people need galvanising. So 60% of the world's zinc goes into making galvanising. Uh, you've also got all the alloys. I mean, people forget that um, you know, brass is an alloy of, of zinc and, uh, and uh, copper. You've got bronze, which was zinc and tin. Uh, and obviously now there's a growing uh, need for it in uh, the sort of the, the EV space as well and also in uh, energy storage as well. So we'll talk about... So it's really a, a future-facing metal underpinned by galvanising but with a growing market uh, as we go into the... Um, low carbon economy. So I didn't realise this, but you know, huge amount of galvanising obviously for the offshore wind farms and everyone's building those, never seem to be stopping. Um, obviously solar panels are coated as well and then there's also the zinc iron battery too, which is a lot safer than the, the lithium iron battery. So obviously there's a, a demand for that as well. So a, enormous amount of potential there as well, underpinning that already very strong market with galvanising. And you can see how that, that has grown you know, very significantly in that renewable space. But underpinned again by this galvanising which is just growing exponentially. And this is what really attracted me to zinc and it's the reason why I guess I, I moved over commodities after a long time in nickel was because in nickel we've all seen this Indonesian situation. The Indonesians 10, 15 years ago didn't produce any nickel at all much. They did a bit of exporting of, of ore. The government uh, put this ban in place. The ore wasn't allowed to be exported. There's been 14 billion US dollars invested in the country and now the, they produce half the world's nickel and are flooding the world with obviously cheap, you know, obviously not ESG friendly material, but certainly the Chinese are lapping it up and hence we've got a very low price. We don't have that supply demand issue with zinc. There's, and in fact, it's the opposite. There's no Indonesia that's going to come roaring out and produce you know, half the world's production of zinc in the next five, 10 years. It's complete opposite. In fact, if you look at this slide, you can see there's a big gap between what looks like the, the demand forecast and supply probably one of the best supply demand sort of imbalances that I've seen in any commodity. And that's what's really got me excited about zinc and about, about rumble. 
And uh, you've got something like um, half the world's largest mines potentially closing in the next five to ten years, running out of ore. And as we know, it gets harder to develop uh, projects. It doesn't matter where you are in the world. Uh, getting it permitted, getting it approved, getting it built, cost time is, is really rapidly increasing. So that's what I really like about zinc. And I think that that slide probably more than anything got me really excited again in zinc, even though I'd always had an eye on it. Uh, and you know, one of the things that I wanted to do if I was going to jump commodities was get into a, a large project. So um, getting back to Irahidi, this is a, a big system. Um, it's well located up near Waluna, so we could uh, access um, you know, out through Geraldton with Concentrate uh, or up uh, to Port Hedland in that area, or well, good infrastructure. Uh, the discovery was in uh, April 21. And within 24 months, the guys, fantastic team of geologists, had, had actually put the maiden resource out. Um, and uh, then, um, it's a, as we know, it's a, it's a very zinc dominant. But there is um, lead and silver as well. And it's one of the largest zinc discoveries in the world in recent times. And again, that's another thing that's just quite unique. Um, and as I said, it's well located. Um, it's a globally significant resource. I won't go through the details there. It's on the slide, but you know, um, it's there. And it, depending on what cutoff you use, you know, the, obviously the, the lower the cutoff, the, the more tons you have. Um, you know, there's there's enormous potential here. Um, this is a this was a, a uh, greenfields discovery. So it's not an old mine that's been brought back, back in production. It's a completely new area, and uh, and these projects. And when you look at what we've got there with Chinook and and Tonka and some of the other projects, we've just got this huge strike. And the geologists are, are just going to be pestering me all the time, and they have done the previous management for money, so that they can drill all these targets, infill, uh, and work out what we've really got here. Um, I keep talking about world class, and I think that that's what investors look for. They look for world class uh, projects, and uh, and this is potential. When you start talking about kilometres of strike, I mean, I'm used to Savannah, which was 250 metres long and 50 metres wide. I mean, these are, and, and that was a very you know um, good ore body in terms of contained nickel. But you're talking about kilometres here, and and this is where the potential for low cost mining. This is only very shallow. 150 to 200 metres deep. So again, open pitable versus underground. This, this is just so much easier than some of the other projects I've been involved in. Um, we can optimise the open pit. Now, we haven't done a lot of work on this yet. It's, the, the drilling's only really just been finished last year uh, and put the resource out uh, late 23. So you know, we've got a lot more work to do. And obviously, you know, financially, you know, everyone's holding onto their cash at the moment. We're doing the same. We've cut back on the spend and we've reduced the, the overhead. We've let a few people go, unfortunately, but hopefully we can, we can pick those people up again when, when things pick up. Uh, Tonka and Navajo, uh, 11 kilometres by two kilometres. I mean, this is a, the, the, unformity, uh, the um, unconformity, which actually hosts the mineralisation. Uh, open, a long strike and, and down dip. And that's what you'll see in all of these slides, and I won't go through them all, but it's always about potential. We've only drilled a small portion of it, and there's potentially a lot more material. So um, fantastic grades. And you can just see here, all those uh, arrows, open, 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 open. That's what I love, you know, it just keeps going, keeps going. Um, it's flat lying, as I mentioned before, that's open pit potential. So th these are all really important factors when you're developing projects now. And what we're seeing, and certainly that I saw in Nickel a lot, you know, some of the holes we were drilling, eight, nine hundred metres. Uh, someone said to me once, I was sitting in Allendale Square on the 22nd floor in an office, and they said, to hit the ore body we're trying to hit, you've got to drill across to the narrows and you've got to hit a motor car driving across there. That was kind of the target. So we don't have the same sort of issues here. Um, and obviously the mineralisation is much more contiguous. Um, I, I'm, I'm a, an industrial chemist by training, so geology is really, you know, that sort of something that someone else looks after, and we've got some very, very experienced geologists in our team. Um, I'm, I'm much more interested in, in the sort of marketing because it's all very well and good to find something in base metals. You've got to be able to sell it to someone. So that involves getting it out of the ground at a reasonable cost and then actually having the recoveries. And so many projects fall over with the recovery, low recoveries, or they produce a concentrate which has got some deleterious elements in it. So if you look at that, we get high recoveries, you know, over 90% of the zinc, and that's the, that's the key component. It's a coarse grind, so that's really important, as most people know, for capex in terms of milling and, and opex, very, very important. Fast float, so again, smaller, um, potentially smaller plant size, 
and all about sort of optimising and reducing that, that capital and, and operating cost. And you produce a sort of close to 60%, so which is a pretty much a standard, 58% con is sort of the standard. So 59 to 60 is, is getting up there, it's, it's certainly positive. And uh, I also mentioned there are no deleterious elements. And that's really important because, you know, I spent a lot of time selling zinc and then selling nickel concentrate. And there's a lot of material that, that actually gets a discount or can, actually can't be sold because it's got high arsenic, high cadmium, high mercury, something that causes a problem in the smelter process. So, um, you know, high MGO, for instance. I mean, none of those issues we have with this material. So we're very, very lucky. So it's a big system. It's, the grade is good. And we've got those uh, high recoveries and no deleterious elements. So that's a really, really positive for, for this project going forward. One of the other things that's going to be really critical to this project is obviously we've got, you know, the grades are sort of what I would call medium grade, they're not high grade in terms of the global resource. Can we beneficiate this material? And this is becoming more and more of a, of a thing, whether it's uh, the dense media separation, which has been around for a long time, or ore sorting. And a lot of projects now only work because of the ore sorting. And uh, we've undertaken quite a large exploration program to get a, a bulk sample of just under two tonnes, which has gone off to the laboratories now. And we're doing a lot of work on DMS and, and optimisation of the flow sheet around the recoveries. But if the DMS works, you know, there, there could be potentially somewhere between a 2 and a 5% upgrade, uh, or five times upgrade, not percent, sorry, times. And that obviously has a massive implication in terms of you, you mine X tonnes and you're only putting through a, a factor much smaller. So that means the plant smaller and obviously the process uh, to the cost of building it and the operating cost is far lower. So we're really um, hoping like crazy that the DMS works and that we can get an upgrade um, of somewhere which is um, you know, similar to some of those other projects that are listed there. Somewhere between two and five times would, would be fantastic. Um, and look, this slide just really says a lot of people are doing it. Dense media separation has been around for a long time. It's a, it's a very well-known process. Uh, and basically, obviously, you're, you're rejecting the material that doesn't have the, 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 the metals that you want in it. And that obviously, as I said, reduces the amount of material. It's got to go through the, the, the milling uh, part and the, obviously the flotation and then through the, the concentrate dyeing and, and then selling the concentrate. Uh, we've had some recent exploration success on some of the potential extensions and we put out some results before Christmas of, and, um, and we'll have some more results coming out soon about uh, Mato. So again, an, another could be another very, very big system and uh, we just don't know how big this is yet, but uh, it's open in every direction. Again, open pitable, uh, which would be fantastic. Uh, and there are arrows everywhere, open, 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 open. So that's, that's again really exciting for us. Uh, and what we have also done over this period of time is we actually increase our holdings. Hirohiti is a JV, we're 75% an operator. Um, we obviously have picked up a lot of other ground around and, and that's a, mostly 100%, so we've got the, the leverage there as well. Um, we do have some other projects, and I certainly won't go into them today, but obviously there are things like gold at um, Western Queen, lithium uh, and copper as well, and we're in joint venture with some of those, some of them we own 100%. Given it's gold, and we've got a, a resource there, quite a large one, 160,000 ounces, uh, in an old um, open pit and underground project, Western Queen. We've had a lot of interest from, from gold companies, as you could imagine. Uh, the lithium, we've had a lot of interest in as well. So, you know, we are entertaining discussions with those parties about what we do with those assets, because our fundamental focus is on this big, world-class deposit at um, Irohiti. Sustainability. Is that a duck, or is this going on there? <laughs> Sure what that is. <laughs> okay. Was that a question or was it? <laughs> I couldn't quite understand it, but it, you know, come to the booth afterwards and ask it to me again. Um, we do everything as well as we can. You know, we're very sustainable in terms of the way we operate. We've got a very good relationship with the TOs, and we've got a, a, a full-time. Um, um, manager in that regard, Will, who's done a great job. I haven't been up to site yet. I'm heading up with the guys in a couple of weeks. I'm really looking forward to meeting the team. But the previous management and, and the board are very active in, in, in dealing with the locals. 
Uh, quick corporate overview. Uh, you know, the, the team is an experienced team, a lot of ex-Resolute uh, guys, Peter and, uh, and Jeff, uh, Mike, obviously Matthew Banks, everyone knows Matthew's been very successful in a lot of different commodities. Uh, Brett Keelor, who's obviously um, ex-IGO and before that uh, with Peter, I think at Samantha or Resolute as well. Uh, ben, Luke and, uh, and Trevor as well, rounding out a really good team. Uh, and we've got coverage by um, uh, Sam at uh, Wilson's as well. So what are the catalysts for the re-rate? Well, obviously one is the continued drilling, and we are going to keep drilling, and we're going to target those higher grade feeder zones and those extensions. That flotation test work is really key, and, and whether the DMS works, that's going to be really important. Then we'll obviously move into a scoping study, whether we monetise one of our core assets or not. A commodity price bounce would be really nice, and uh, some of our small caps feeling the love are going to be fantastic. And last slide, we've got a lot of zinc. The fundamentals look fantastic. Small caps are super cheap, as we know. You've got to buy Rumble. Yeah,